Hello and welcome. My name is Victor Gijspers and I teach philosophy at Leiden University in the Netherlands. In this video, I want to take a look at an article or chapter written by the epistemologist Richard Feldman. The article is called Reasonable Religious Disagreements and it was published in a book edited by Louisa Anthony called Philosophers Without Gods. Philosophers Without Gods by uh, Louisa Anthony. So, in this article, Reasonable Religious Disagreements, Feldman is going to talk about disagreements. Uh, he's going to talk about religion too, but this is really mostly about disagreements. And so what he talks about in this chapter is going to be applicable to other disagreements. It's not necessarily going to be applicable to other discussions about religion, right? The emphasis here is really on disagreements. Now, in epistemology, there is actually quite a bit of debate about disagreements. So it might be useful to say a little bit about that before I delve into the chapter itself. So the epistemology of disagreement basically asks the question what you ought to do when you find out that you disagree with someone. OK, so I have an idea about something. I have a conviction about something. I believe something. And now I meet somebody else who disagrees with me. What kind of effect should that have on me and my beliefs? Well, one thing we could say is that it depends on who I'm meeting and what our disagreement is about, and especially sort of the combination of these two things, right? So if I meet my young son and my young son and I have different ideas about the age of the earth, uh, I don't have to change my beliefs very much, right? Because I have very little uh, reason to believe that my very young son has better ideas about the age of the earth than I have. On the other hand, if I meet my young son and we have a disagreement or he turns out to believe something different about the name of one of the kids in his class, okay, you know, maybe he's more of an authority on that than I am because I'm almost never around in his class. And so when you meet somebody and there's a specific topic, well, one thing you're always going to sort of think about is, well, who of these two people, I or this other person, knows more about this topic, right? And if it's clear that you know more about the topic, then it's, it's not very interesting, epistemologically speaking, because you should just prefer your own opinion. But if you have good reasons to believe that the other person knows more about this topic, uh, that it's like really an authority compared to you, then you probably have good reasons to change your opinion or at least to suspend belief, right? To sort of stop being convinced of whatever you were convinced of uh, until you've been able to sort of check up on things. So the epistemologically really interesting case is the case where the person that you're talking to is, you know, approximately in, in an equally good situation for having true beliefs about this particular topic. So the technical term used here is it is your epistemic peer. So somebody is your epistemic peer when about the topic under discussion, the two of you have a, an equally sort of good chance of having a correct belief, of having a true belief. Okay, and in practice, it might be very hard to sort of find out whether somebody is your epistemic peer, but that's, you know, that's what we're gonna sort of assume in the more epistemologically interesting situations that we're talking to an epistemic peer. Now, even an epistemic peer might, you know, not always have thought things through correctly, or they might not have all the available evidence, or you might not have thought things through correctly, or you might not have all the available evidence. So there's actually a lot of ways in which two epistemic peers could be in disagreement. And so one question you could ask is, and it's been asked a lot in, in recent epistemology, is, well, what should you do in such a case, right? Should you hold on to your own belief or should you suspend your judgment, right? And say, okay, I, I, I don't know what to believe because this other person who is just as much to be trusted as I am um, has come to a different conclusion. Okay, and it's, you know, there are different, different ideas about that. That's not exactly what Richard Feldman's article is about though. Richard Feldman is going to add something to this 
sort of standard scenario. And what he's going to add is that I and the person I meet are going to have a chat, even an in-depth chat about this topic, right? I'm going to lay out in the open my evidence and my arguments, and they are going to do the same. And we are going to talk and discuss until we understand the way that the other person has come to their conclusion. Okay, so it's not just that we disagree. We disagree and then we have a long discussion and chat, right? Like not trying to sort of um, clobber the other, uh, other person with words, but you know, really trying to understand each other, like a really good discussion. And then at the end of that really good discussion, we still disagree. Okay, we still disagree, but this is the situation that Feldman is interested in. We still disagree, but we think the other person is perfectly reasonable, right? So we don't think they're obstinate. We don't think they're stupid. We don't think they're making some clear mistake that we've pointed out to them and that they you know, are just unwilling to admit to. I mean, in all of those cases, we might say that they're not being reasonable, right? No, we think that they're actually reasonable. So we've all put all our ideas on the table. We discuss them thoroughly. We still disagree. And we think that we are both reasonable, right? I think that you're reasonable, you think that I'm reasonable. And of course, we both think that we ourselves are reasonable too. So that's the kind of reasonable disagreement that Feldman is interested in. And the article is called Reasonable Religious Disagreements because Feldman becomes interested in this when he gives a, a sort of philosophy of religion class. And it turns out that there are people with very different ideas about religion. There are theists and atheists. Among the theists, there are, you know, different religious groups. Um, and they have a lot of discussions. And at the end, you know, everybody basically still believes what they believed when they started class. Uh, but they are also very tolerant towards each other, right? To the point where they, where they are willing to say that the other people's beliefs are reasonable, even if maybe they're not true. Right? I mean, you sort of have to say that they're not true, but we'll, we'll say a little bit more about that in a second. Okay, here is what felt the question that Feldman asks. How is this possible, right? How is it possible that all the arguments and evidence have been put on the table and we've discussed them thoroughly? And then at the end, I think, right, I think, well, it's reasonable from this evidence and these arguments to draw conclusion A, for instance, to draw the conclusion that God does not exist. You draw the opposite conclusion. You see the same arguments, the same evidence, and you draw the conclusion that God exists. And yet I think you are reasonable. I mean, how could that be? Feldman asks. How could it be that I think that it's reasonable to draw from all this evidence and arguments, one conclusion, that I see you do the opposite, and that nevertheless, I think that you are being reasonable too. Well, that's the puzzle. And in the end, Feldman is going to tell us that he thinks that the puzzle can't be solved. Right? It's impossible to be in this situation. You can't really believe that the evidence and arguments show that it's reasonable to draw your conclusion and that somebody who draws another conclusion is also reasonable. Okay, and then we can do two things, right? We can either say, well, the other person is unreasonable or we can say, okay, I don't think that the evidence supports my conclusion, right? I mean, maybe we should both suspend judgment. We'll come to that uh, at the end of the article. So the text, Reasonable Religious Disagreements by Feldman. It's not a very technical article at all. It's uh, very accessible. So I haven't read the rest of this book, Philosophers Without Gods by uh, Louisa Anthony, uh, but if all the other articles are just as accessible, then this is really a book that, that you can read without any, any like, specific background in, in philosophy. Um, so if you're interested in, in philosophy of religion, um, it, might be, it might be an interesting book. But again, I haven't read, uh, read the rest of it. So here's Feldman is going to do. The first thing he's going to do is he's going to sort of put aside two ways of dealing with disagreements that he's not very interested in. So one is what he calls intolerance, and the other is what he calls relativism. And so intolerance is basically just saying, well, I'm right, and uh, you're all stupid, and I don't have to listen to you. Okay, I'm right, you're all stupid, and uh, 
I don't have to listen. I'm not even interested in your arguments, maybe. And Feldman, I mean, he, he puts it forward in a relatively extreme way uh, by quoting a um, not very philosophically sophisticated columnist that he doesn't like. And yeah, so it's, it's easy to dismiss, right? Because it's sort of an extreme position. Um, okay, we dismiss it. The other thing Feldman di dismisses um, after a very short discussion is relativism. It's specifically a kind of relativism that says, well, I'm right and you're right too, right? So it's true for me that God doesn't exist and it's true for you that God does exist. And Feldman quite rightly suggests that that doesn't seem to be a very stable or plausible or in a sense, even interesting philosophical position. Because I mean, what is left of the concept of truth if just believing something or believing something strongly is enough for it to be true, like for me? I mean, what does that even mean, right? Unless it means something purely psychological where God exists for me just means believing God plays an important role in my life. Um, it's, it's hard to see how something like the existence of God could be relative, right? How it could be the case that for me, God exists and for you, God doesn't exist. I mean, God exists or doesn't exist. It's, it's supposed to be a claim about reality. And if it's supposed to be a claim about reality, then it can't be relative in this sense. Now, I think Feltman's discussion of relativism is very, very short. Um, there are so many forms of relativism, right? And relativism really doesn't have to take this form. And I'll say a little bit more about that uh, later on. But we're going to put this aside too. So we're going to assume that there's a real disagreement. So not this kind of relativism. And we're going to assume that um, we're interested in, in talking to the other person, right? We're not just going to dismiss their ideas and say that they're so irrational that we don't even sort of really have to have to engage with them. And that means that we're in the realm of like real serious disagreement where we can talk about things. Okay, so Feldman does a couple of clarifications and I'm not going to go uh, over all of them. Um, so uh, it's really supposed to be, for instance, a disagreement about whether something is true or false. It's not a disagreement about practice. It's not a disagreement about uh, what is pragmatic to do or something like that. We're really sort of differing, for instance, about whether God exists or God doesn't exist. I mean, which of these, which of these, two, things, uh, which of these two things is true? And then Feldman poses his questions. And he wonders whether epistemic peers who have shared their evidence can have reasonable disagreements. Like, can they have reasonable disagreements? And also, can they sort of have reasonable disagreements and believe that the other person is also reasonable? And it's really the latter case that he's most interested in, right? That's the case that I sketched earlier. We have a discussion. We disagree. Even after the discussion, we still disagree. And then I think, well, okay, I think you're wrong because I think that from all this evidence, my position follows, God doesn't exist. But when you claim that God exists, uh, I sort of understand that. And I nevertheless think that you are reasonable, right? Is that possible? That's the, that's the main question. Here. Is that possible? Okay. And so Feldman is going to, um, first of all, point out that it's a, a prima facie problem here, right? At first sight, there's a problem here. The problem is that if I think that this evidence that we have, that we share, right? The evidence that we share and the arguments that we share uh, supports the conclusion that God doesn't exist. Well, that seems to mean that I believe that based on the evidence, it's reasonable to conclude that God doesn't exist. But if it's reasonable to conclude that God doesn't exist, it can't be reasonable to conclude that God does exist. I mean, you can't have evidence from which you can reasonably conclude both A and not A, right? For instance, suppose if the evidence is just uh, perfectly in balance, right? Then we should conclude nothing, right? Then we should suspend judgment. We should say that we don't know whether God exists or God doesn't exist. But I can't really have this body of evidence and say, well, you know, given this body of evidence, it's reasonable to conclude that God doesn't exist. But you are also reasonable to conclude that God does exist. I mean, how does that work? Okay. So what Feldman is going to do, and this is sort of the main argumentative part of the paper, is he's going to look at four ways in which maybe, you know, this could work. 
four ways of explaining or defending the possibility of reasonable disagreement. Uh, and for each of them, Feldman is going to claim that it doesn't work. Okay, so let's, uh, let's go through them. So here's the first thing. Maybe we might draw different conclusions from the same evidence. Um, well, Feldman says that, that, and I really sort of talked about this uh, already just now, um, drawing different conclusions from the same evidence just doesn't seem to be sort of possible. Well, it seems possible, but it doesn't seem possible to do it sort of reasonably, right? I mean, if the evidence is there, I mean, let's say it's a murder investigation. Well, if the evidence points towards the butler, then we should conclude that it's the butler who did it. And if the evidence points towards the gardener, then we should conclude that it's the gardener who did it. And if there's evidence pointing towards the butler and pointing towards the gardener, and it's of sort of equal strength, then we should suspend judgment, right? There's no, there's no way to sort of generate a choice here. It can't be the case that the evidence is such that it's reasonable to either conclude that it's the butler or conclude that it's the gardener, whatever you want. I mean, that doesn't seem to be a possible situation. So, okay, Feldman doesn't really think that this is that this is possible. So here's the second thing. The second thing is, well, maybe maybe it is possible to draw different conclusions from different uh, from the same evidence if we're just like starting out from very different situations. So maybe we have different background knowledge, or maybe we think about the evidence in different ways, right? Maybe we even have something like different fundamental principles or different world views. Um, so maybe from one point of view, from sort of one world view, when I, I don't know, uh, some witnesses tell me a story about a, um, a miracle, right? Maybe from one world view or fundamental principle, it's reasonable to conclude that they are deluded or lying. And from another point of view or worldview, uh, it's reasonable to conclude that this was a manifestation of the divine that these people witnessed, right? And so uh, maybe we can actually have the same evidence and draw different conclusions from it. Well, what Feldman says here is he says, you know, that could sort of be true if those worldviews themselves are not a part of the discussion. But as soon as we sort of really delve into why we believe things, then we're going to have to explain those worldviews, right? We're going to have to put them on the table. We're going to have to add them to the ideas that are under discussion. And then once we have done that, you know, the question of disagreement is just, you know, post for those worldviews. Right now, it's the question about which of those worldviews is reasonable to adopt, right? Should we adopt one of them? Should we adopt another of them? Um, or don't we have any evidence showing that either the one or the other is better, in which case maybe we should suspend judgment about that. And so Feldman's tactic here is to say, well, whatever you bring to the discussion should come to the table during the discussion, and then it becomes part of the discussion, and it becomes part of the evidence and part of the argumentation. And so this is not a way out, right? Yes, these discussions have a, have a tendency to become larger and larger, uh, and so it turns out that we have to talk about more maybe than we originally thought we had. Um, but once we've done that, right, when it's all on the table, we're back to our starting position that for any disagreement, we would like to have reasons. Um, and the reasons can't really point both ways. Okay. And that makes sense. I think Feldman's argument makes sense, but he is assuming something very important here. Right. What he is assuming here is that um, is that the standards of the standards of evidence and justification themselves are not part of a worldview. Right. So the assumption here is that I can put my my assumptions, my my worldview, even on the table, and rationally discuss it from sort of outside of that worldview. Right. So the idea is that it's not the case that our fundamental epistemic principles are part of that worldview. So it's not supposed to be the case that you and I find out that we just reason in, in different ways in some sort of fundamental sense. 
Now, if somebody were to claim, and I mean, this is another kind of relativism, right? A relativism that is a lot more interesting than the relativism that we talked about early on in this video. Uh, that was the relativism where you just said, oh, well, God exists for you and God doesn't exist for me. And now we're thinking about a relativism that says, well, even epistemic standards sort of differ from person to person or from group to group or from paradigm to paradigm or whatever we want to call it. Um, and so there is no such thing as a neutral discussion. Well, suppose that we do want to say that, then um, that kind of relativist would have some work to do in explaining how to think about these disagreements. I mean, if I'm in my worldview, could I say that another worldview is also rational? Well, if the epistemic standards are really in my worldview and I sort of can't step outside of them, then it seems that I should just say that the other person is unreasonable. Right? because they're not using the epistemic standards that I am committed to so much that I can't even step outside of them. And so if we really take seriously the idea that certain epistemic standards have been baked into your very identity, um, then I don't think there's a basis here for reasonable disagreement. Right? You should just say that other worldviews are irrational. Whereas if you're willing to say that other worldviews are rational too, then apparently you are able to step outside of your own worldview, look at them sort of neutrally. Well, that's precisely what Feldman wants you to do, right? So although I don't think that Feldman has a sort of, um, he doesn't even really mention it, and I don't think he has given us an argument here against sort of epistemic relativism. Um, maybe he doesn't have to, because epistemic relativism doesn't really seem to generate this idea of reasonable disagreement. Or maybe it does, but then epistemic relativism would be uh, seem a very unstable position. Okay, so I'll, I'll leave it there. I think there's more to say about relativism than Feldman does here, um, but certainly there's no sort of easy way, easy road here to defend the possibility of um, rational disagreement using relativism. I think that's uh, that's clear. So in the third. Uh, case, right, the third way of maybe defending rational disagreement is the idea that in practical cases, uh, in sort of real cases, evidence is never fully shared, right? So the idea would be that it's kind of a fiction that we can sit around a table and present all the evidence and all the arguments. Um, maybe I have some evidence as an atheist uh, that is just not, I can't, express it in words or you can't maybe really get it or understand it because of your sort of religious uh, background or maybe you as the religious person have certain evidence of I don't know direct evidence of God or something like that which is also incommunicable um, and so we can we can say maybe that we have it or we can indicate that there's some strength through our position that is obvious to us but we can't really communicate and so we can't share it. And so in the discussion, we don't share everything. And so there's something that only I have, which points towards the non-existence of God. And there's something else that only you have, which points towards the existence of God. And that's why we can have a reasonable disagreement because I can say, well, you know, given my special personal thing, I should conclude this. And you, given your special personal thing, should conclude this other thing. And Feldman doesn't think that that works either. And he doesn't think that it works because if I, if I take seriously the idea that you have this special personal thing, and if you take seriously the idea that I have this special personal thing, well, that's evidence that we should accord its proper weight to, right? If I really believe, well, if I don't believe that you have special personal religious experiences, then I don't think you're being reasonable, right? But if I do think you have special religious experience, well, now I have evidence that you have special religious experiences, and that surely is evidence on the side of God exists. And so I should weigh that evidence, even if I don't sort of have it directly, I have it indirectly, right? You tell me about it. It's just like you telling me what you've seen, except that this is a, a very special kind of evidence. But if I accept it, if I accept it enough to hold that you are reasonable in following it, I should also follow it, right? And so Feldman thinks that this actually doesn't generate the possibility of rational disagreement. Um, so finally, 
maybe um, maybe it's possible that we both think that uh, the other person makes some uh, some mistake, uh, but we don't, uh, and so we think that the other person is unreasonable. So I maybe think that you have been blinded by your youth and like the kind of what you've been taught by your parents at a young age. And you think I'm blinded by immorality or something like that. Um, and so we both think that the other is blinded and we think that the other is unreasonable. But like from a third person perspective, uh, we are both sort of just weighing whatever evidence we have and we, we seem kind of reasonable. And Feldman says, well, maybe that's possible. Like, maybe that's possible. But that's that's not a case where we... I mean, that's a case where we don't think that the other person is reasonable. And so that's not a case where um, we have a reasonable disagreement in the sense that I'm interested in. Right? It's not the case where I think that you draw the wrong conclusion, even after discussion, but are still reasonable. Okay. So those were the four options that Feldman talks about. And then Feldman says, okay, so suppose that we conclude from this that there is no such thing as a reasonable disagreement. What then? Well, we can take, do two things. We can take the hard line. And the hard line is that I'm right and you are wrong. Right? And so you are just not reasonable. And that's... I mean, if we really... If we really had a good discussion, and if I really believe that you are sincere, then it's hard to take this hard line, Feldman says. It's hard because, I mean, what reason do I have in the end to believe that my position in this dispute is stronger than yours? Right? If I really believe that you have been like totally good faith discussant, uh, we talked about it, we really listened to each other, we we were not hung up by any sort of um, uh, deep, deep sort of psychological problem or something like that. Well, what reason do I have to claim that my position is superior to yours? I mean, what reason do I have to just sort of brush you aside and say, okay, well, that was interesting, but of course, in the end, I'm right and you're wrong. Well, Feldman says it, that doesn't really seem to be a, a rational response. Right? And so what we should be doing in these kinds of cases, maybe, is, uh, is the second possibility, which is to say, well, we need to suspend judgment. Right? We don't, if you sort of really disagree with me at the end, and I really disagree with you, on the basis of the same evidence, then maybe we should both say, okay, well, in that case, we need, we need to both be neutral. Right? We need both. We both of us need to say, well, it's it's apparently more complicated than we thought, and apparently the evidence is not as conclusive as it seems to me. And so, I'm going to weaken my belief, maybe even to the point of suspending judgment. Right? We just need more evidence, or we we don't know, or you know, we need to talk to more people, or whatever. But there's a real reason, uh, Feldman thinks, for a sort of moderate skeptical alternative where the skepticism here is just that we okay it turns out that there are certain things that it's really hard to get knowledge about right we thought we knew something until we found out about the disagreement and now we no longer think that we know something okay so that is Feldman's conclusion um I think it's a very nice article I maybe want to put one other thing on the table here so when I think about certain disagreements that, let's say, I've been involved in myself, oh, let's take a philosophical disagreement. Let's take something like um, different theories of time. So I like to defend a, a, a view of time which is called presentism, but there are lots of other philosophers who are also very smart who defend this view called uh, eternalism. So what do I think about that? What do I think about that disagreement? Do I think that they're reasonable to hold eternalism? Well, yes and no. I think that they might be sort of like subjectively reasonable that right now those philosophers have, um, you know, the, the reasons that they have that are accessible to them for believing in eternalism are stronger than the reasons that they have for presentism. But I also think that it's in the end not a reasonable position 
right? I think, you know, I've thought really long and hard about it. Uh, I really think that presentism is, is the right position to have. And so I would like to convince these other philosophers, right? So we haven't had this around the table discussion yet. Well, we've talked, but okay, I haven't really worked out my arguments in the strongest form possible, right? I should, I should really work them out better than I've done before. I should write better articles, give better talks, spend more time with these people. And of course, when I do that, I'm going to find out that there are certain other concerns, that I'm addressing certain concerns, and then they say, yeah, okay, that's all right. I mean, now I see what you're trying to get at and how to make this sort of a coherent and consistent story and so on and so forth. But I'm worried about how your presentism sort of seems to contradict certain ideas from natural science, from physics, from general relativity, maybe. Okay, and so I, we have to talk about that. We have to talk about the exact nature of relativity theory, maybe, but we also have to talk about the relation between science and philosophy, because I want to claim that if in a scientific theory of time, nobody talks about the present, that doesn't mean that the present isn't real, because, hey, physical theories may focus perhaps only on certain aspects of reality and not other aspects of reality. And maybe these other philosophers think, no, 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 wait a second. Um, Physical theories are sort of our best guide towards the metaphysical truth when it comes to things like space and time. And so we really have to think about the relation between physics and metaphysics. And I think I've got like some arguments and ideas about that, but I haven't really worked them out very well yet. I sort of have a very strong hunch, a very, very clear idea about where to look, but I haven't really worked it out, right? And so I think I can do it but I need more time and I need more time to discuss things and I need more. Oh, and once we've done that, you know, it's probably going to turn out that we also need to talk about like 17 other philosophical topics in order to sort of really get this thing going. Okay. It's probably the same with religion, right? Even if you follow a, an entire semester class about the philosophy of religion with Richard Feldman, you might feel that you, you haven't really gotten everything across yet. Right. So I'm tempted to say that one way to think that there might be reasonable disagreements is, well, basically it's Feldman's third option, the idea that not everything is on the table, but not so much because there is some special incommunicable thing there, right? That I've got some special insight that I can't tell you about, but just that some of these questions are so big that they have ramifications everywhere. And we need to talk about almost everything, like even the things that we haven't really worked out ourselves, like in a very explicit way yet. So we have to talk about almost everything um, in order to, to really put on the table what we want to put on the table. And that's a lot of work. I mean, that might even be too much work for us ever to sort of really do, because we might not be able to spend like <coughs> all the time and, and energy that we, uh, that we need on, uh, on that particular disagreement. So I suppose that in the end, I fall somewhere between the idea that, yeah, there can be rational religious disagreements or disagreements about anything, um, and Feldman's moderate skepticism. Because of course, there's a certain kind of skepticism involved in the story that I was just telling too, right? So I'm promising myself that sure, I can work out that story between physics and metaphysics. Or I can work out that story about um, how God is not a being, but being itself, right? Uh, or I can work out, you know, and maybe you're right. And maybe you're not right. It's sometimes when you try to work something out, it doesn't work. And you feel that there must be some truth here, but it's, uh, you can change your mind. Uh, that's a possibility. And so here's maybe the way that I would like to see this, this stuff. And I'm not saying that it's better than Feldman's. Maybe he and I rationally disagree about this. <coughs> but of course, I am saying that it's better than Feldman. Well, so the idea is this. A rational disagreement is a situation where I think that I, I could persuade you if you, you know, remain rational and willing to listen to me but I don't have the tools at my disposal just yet. Neither the time, nor the worked out arguments, nor sort of a real view of everything 
<coughs> of how all these topics we need to talk about are connected and which are the ones that we need to talk about. And so it's sort of a promissory note, right? Rational disagreement is sort of disagreement where you think that the other is rational in the sense that, yeah, you know, what we've put on the table allows allows them to to believe what they what they believe. But there's also this sort of promissory note where I think, well, but I, I can put more on the table, right? I can put more on the table and that would, would get you over the edge towards me. Maybe that's a way to, uh, to think about rational disagreements. All right. Thank you for listening and see you in another video.